you give a trailer editor just a folder of cool ass footage <laughs> that's called like indie hour, they're gonna be like, oh, <laughs> like what? Wouldn't that be awesome? I don't if... even give a shit if that's in the movie. It's cool. I do remember though coming coming out of that movie, and the first thing I thought was like. Where the f was that TIE Fighter shot? <laughs> and you the whole can't story just be putting TIE Fighters in shots where they don't exist in the movie. These coked out trailer bros need to calm need to calm the f*** down. You know what would be cool? You know what would be really cool? It's like, my dude, tone it down a bit. Uh, I love that we can work while we're on cocaine. That's bro, awesome. bro, TIE Fighter in the background yeah. while she's walking. Boom! Oh, you f just blew my mind, man. Oh, my man. God, dude. Let's go to lunch. Yeah. It's 9 a.m. I don't give a shit. Let's do coke. Let's go to lunch. <laughs> Making stuff is hard, especially in the entertainment world when there are millions of dollars on the line. And we are going to talk about these disastrous, never-ending, and sometimes dangerous productions. This is The Shit Show. Hello, fellow rebel scum. I'm Captain Ian, joined by Jedi Ray. Hello. And clone trooper Clint. Oh, you should have said, hello there. Hello there. I don't know. I don't know things about Star Wars. I don't know how Jedi talk. I'm hello. Just, I'm just like, it's yeah, but Ray never met Obi-Wan, so maybe. You know. Very true. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wait, you're talking about, oh no, Ray in the, okay. Star Wars Ray. Yeah, I'm asking you, Jenny Ray. You never met Obi Wan, really? My never God. in my whole life. Well, welcome to the rebellion, y'all. Mm -hmm. Woo! With Disney just finishing the first season of Andor on Disney Plus, what a perfect time to revisit a previous shit show from the other channel and the gamble that was the very first non Skywalker Star Wars film. Let's talk Rogue One. Yes, That's no, it's clear estate. that you remade the movie. Did I Were sweat you it? scared about it? Because it's no, Star Wars. That's, because, I, I'm you know not asking what? the emotional question, no, not the I, I, No, I was actually, in fact, that was my superpower. A, I don't like Star Wars. Not that I like, I just never been interested in Star Wars ever. So I don't, I had no reverence for it whatsoever. I was unafraid about that. And they were in such, they were in such a swamp. They, they were, needed you. Well, they were just in so much terrible, terrible trouble that all you could do is, 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 is improve their position. Um, the gumption, the balls of Disney and Bob Iger and, and the people there to gamble on what they gambled on is astonishing. All right, so get us started. Clint, what is all the things? Oh, shit. All right. I was waiting for a Star Wars uh, episode because I just have a shit ton of Star Wars stuff. Yeah. And it was really hard I for me assumed. to narrow it down. Yeah. yeah. So I'm wearing my Imperial officer's hat. <laughs> I'm wearing my Star Wars shirt. I have my Republic credit little actual oh actual God. medal race. Right? So actual yep, credit. Yep, yep. yep. Uh, I have I have my Holiday special life day orb from <laughs> Life Day. It lights what? up. So if you watch the holiday special, the Chewie and his family are holding this orb for Life Day. So I have my Life Day. That orb. is that's so obscure. That yeah, yeah, very deep. Uh, I have my Jedi holocron, which here you, it turns on and Obi Wan speaks to you, but I won't actually like have. That's all you get. Uh, Obi Wan <laughs> speaks to us. Um, Whoa, that's cool. Let's see. I have all of my Kyber crystals. <laughs> <laughs> a whole Jedi temple's worth. A whole of yeah. Kyber there's crystals. a bunch. There's a bunch. I brought. Oh, because that goes in. That goes into your lightsaber. It goes into my lightsabers and the holocron. I have my my Jedi Temple Guard keys that I 3D printed. <laughs> oh my god, you're such a nerd. Uh, and then the final, last but not least, because I've got so much other shit. Um, <laughs> I have chopper. My chopper droid. What the hell? From, from uh, Star Wars Rebels. He makes a cameo. Did, in, in, is uh, that also 3D printed? Yeah, he's in the I back wish. of Rogue One. Yeah. yeah, so here we go. Ready? Uh, he, he... Let's have him talk. Uh. Ready for this? <laughs> he's just chatting along. Hey, hey. <laughs> what the? It's so cute. Is that what he sounds like in the thing? In the show, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, he makes a cameo in, in Rogue One. Yeah. So I figured it would be appropriate uh, to bring my chopper droid. Perfect. 
He could be just chilling here and making just make some commentary on his own. Ch- uh, Chopper, what do you think of the show? Oh, fuck you. <laughs> Yeah, he's cool. already have an abusive relationship with a droid. <laughs> <I know. laughs> they are pretty sassy. I know. Some they're, of them. Of, they're all full of sass. So that's that's uh, just like a small smidgen. Just a Sm- Did you even bring a lightsaber? I, I, no, I've got... My son was like, Dad, do you want to bring my lightsaber? I was like, oh, buddy, I appreciate it. You're such a great kid. Uh, I've got so many other things. I thought about bringing my full scale one-to-one replica of um, the Mandalorian's blaster that Nerf put out. <laughs> Uh, but that that sucker is literally like as long as my wingspan. It's it's such a huge thing. Oh my god! So well, I'm just gonna leave these here. We're just, yeah, well, I, turn, I turned them off, so he's not gonna talk or anything to the show. But uh, well, this is... I have a feeling we'll there will be other Star Wars things to talk about in the future. So perhaps you can. Yeah, you just um, blew your load, man. No, no, not I mean, all no he can no. bring <laughs> other stuff true. for it. I I I got. There's so much more to come. Um. Well, I haven't have brought no Star Wars stuff. So I'm oh, wearing a Ian's, shirt. <gasps> Ian's got something. Got Look at that. Shirt. Okay. Continuing. I turned him off. I don't know. What the hell? Dude, uh, shut up, man. Did I turn him off? You turned off the... You turned off the remote. The remote. He's off now. That was okay. perfect timing. I love that so much. All right, let's begin. He's like... Was he, brah, was he supposed brah. to just... Is he just reminding you? Or did he, was he responding to audio? Uh, no, he's just he just was remind, reminding us. Yeah, okay. a little timer in there. <laughs> he's becoming sentient. Oh, yeah, that was then that was perfect timing. Okay, in two thousand five, we're going all the way back to two thousand five. Before the release of Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith, George Lucas announces uh, a TV series, Star Wars Underworld. I remember that. Yeah, and this would be like it would be about like side stories in the universe that didn't necessarily have to do with the Skywalkers. And uh, the big rumor of like a lot of that time was that it was just going to be the Boba Fett show. Um, so <laughs> the Boba Fett show. <laughs> <laughs> um, visual, visual effects supervisor of Revenge of the Sith, uh, John Knoll pitches an episode. His idea is to take the opening crawl from a new hope and make that into a, uh, one of the episodes. Clint, what is the opening crawl? Uh, the rebel spies have uh, taken stolen plans of the Death Star, and uh, now they're in a hot pursuit. The rebels are being chased by Darth Vader. <laughs> <laughs> More it's or not, less. It's not verbatim. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What, is the, what is the opening line? Um, did you hear that? It's a, oh, 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 like the spoken line or the one in the crawl? <laughs> Oh, um, it's a period of galactic civil war. Period of civil war. Oh, not galactic uh, civil yeah. war. No. Oh, fuck. But yeah, oh, I, I guess I got to return all this shit. <laughs> yeah, you're you're Turn losing my fan card. You're yeah, losing so Look, much. Look, I Star like Wars Star Wars, but I'm not like a. <laughs> I'm just gonna track that back. I'm track that back. Yeah. I like Star Wars, but I'm not looks at all the shit on the table. I'm not like some kind of mega fan or anything. <laughs> I don't 3D print obscure things from random TV shows. Well, yes. Uh the period of Civil War, rebel spaceships striking from a hidden base have won their first victory. And that was when the rebel spies managed to steal the secret plans to the Death Star. So it would be a Mission Impossible style adventure about stealing the Death Star plans. This was his idea, John Knowles. Uh, If the original Star Wars was an allegory to World War II, then this would be an allegory to the Manhattan Project about Mm. making the Death Star. And after the first successful nuclear test, the leader of said project, Robert Oppenheimer felt extreme remorse about what he had created and famously quoted a Hindu scripture, I have become death, the destroyer of worlds. Noel titled his pitch, Destroyer of Worlds. Mm-hmm. So that was the the title of the episode. Yeah, that just, just doesn't roll off the tongue as well as Death Star. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's like what they originally wanted to call the like body snatchers or whatever. What was that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they came from another they world. They came from another world. It's like, get out of here. <laughs> uh, it's determined that the episode wouldn't fit their timeline for this this series and was put on the shelf. But ironically, Underworlds never materialized, um, and a lot of it was repurposed into The Mandalorian and uh, The Boba Fett Show, like 
years later. Right. Um, when yeah, when would when did they originally want to make this show? You said in the seventies? No, two thousand five. Oh, two thousand five, okay. <laughs> yeah. After I I just... Revenge of the Sith was about to come out. Got it. Okay. And so you know who Noel is? He is the now chief creative officer at ILM and the co inventor with his brother, co inventor of Photoshop. What? Whoa. I know, right? I know what that is. <laughs> like, mm. what a, I've what, heard of what that. What a resume bu- builder. That's my fandom. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk more about that. <laughs> Who invented InDesign? <laughs> um, Love that guy. <laughs> so, okay, fast forward to January of 2012. George Lucas says he's done with making blockbusters. He's sick of studio control and studio notes and just people like picking at everything. And he's definitely done with making Star Wars films. Clint will be our George Lucas. Okay, I gotta get hmm, her, her, her. I gotta get the <laughs> jowly. More jowly. Get in the in the side of your mouth. It rhymes. It's like poetry. Okay. <laughs> Why would I make any more when everybody yells at you all the time and says, "What a terrible person you are." <laughs> kind of makes you feel bad a little bit. <laughs> I know. Well, that, that's like, what other what other fandom out there, right? Do fans like all of them pick on more? No, think <laughs> about all like, of them though. No, but like think about uh, mm, <laughs> like the the fans of Star Wars are just so divided in and of oh, its, yeah. in and of itself of that fandom. That's you don't true. see that with Star Trek. Most Star Trek most most Trekkies like love most things Star Trek, but and there's no other real like fandoms that I can think of where. There's just such a uh, division a division of gatekeepers. It's either oh, it's either 100%. shit or it's all awesome. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I wouldn't even say that. I always think it's it's like the comic book guy thing on The Simpsons, where he's like, his favorite thing in the world is Star Wars, and he hates Star Wars. Star Wars. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like that's yeah. true. Like it's always like the the hardcore fans are like, oh, you know, the first one's okay. It's all about Empire Strikes Back. Return of the Jedi is terrible, and everything is terrible. Like, and it's but I'm the hardcore Star Wars fan, and you're like, oh my god. Like, I think fa- you're no right. One, gatekeeping. No one cares that you love it the most. <laughs> yeah. No one gives a shit. All right. I have all of this stuff, and I love Star Wars, and I but I there's things I like and dislike about it, but like I'm not. I'm not I, I'm not a comic book guy though. You're not uh, yeah, pushing exactly. your glasses up about uh-huh. it. Yeah. Uh, I feel like let's... fandom in general is becoming more divisive, but it definitely I think started with Star Wars. It's kind of all oh, been sure. that way. Oh for sure. Oh, for sure. Are there any Tolkien fans out there that are like, <laughs> no. mm, the two towers? Mm. I mean, now there are because or, of the Rings of Power. Yeah, or think should have been taller. Divisive. Yeah. But okay, we, well, let's return to that conversation at the end. Um, so Lucas wants to return to innovating technology and maybe makes like smaller indie films. Um, and then that June of 2012, Lucas announced he's retiring, and he has asked producer Kathleen Kennedy to oversee Lucasfilm. I was going to ask, has he made other films? And if he did, what studio did he do them under if he doesn't have Lucasfilm anymore? I don't know. He hasn't done anything since uh, Red Tails was one that he <laughs> produced. Um, gotcha. And that's wow. when he was getting sick of uh, the studio notes. So and he hasn't really done anything since. So maybe he's just enjoying his retirement. Yeah. He's just like, I don't want, I want to make other kinds of movies. None movies. <laughs> yeah. That's the kind of movies I want to make. Uh, so Kennedy was um, has produced ev- nearly every single film by Steven Spielberg, mm-hmm. Lucas's best friend. So... Lucas will stay on for a year and just kind of like help her uh, transition. But then at by October, Disney, under the all-consuming Bob Iger, uh, buys Lucasfilm for $4 billion. Mm. <laughs> um, and at the same time, Disney announces Star Wars Episode Seven for 2015. That's Rise of Skywalker. Or wait. <laughs> Awaken- Skywalker Awakening? What the fuck is it called? Awaken Skywalker the, the, Rising, the, the Force Awakens. <laughs> the Force Awakens. I well, I would have gotten there eventually. You, you were starting to wake up, just like the title yeah, of the yeah. film. Yeah, exactly. The Ray Awakens. <laughs> um. So Kennedy is also open to ideas for non-Skywalker saga films, and John Knoll's colleagues are like, "Dude, you gotta tell her your pitch, like, because it's such a cool idea. Like, it's it'd be so fun to like see that." And so he's like, oh, okay, might as well. Uh, then I'll, reg- uh, if I don't, I'll regret it. And then Kennedy loves it. Um, but it's a while before they kind of like get that one rolling. In 2013, Lucasfilm announces two standalone films written by Lawrence Kasdan, writer of 
Empire. And Indiana Joneses. And Indiana Jones and uh, co-writer on Return of the Jedi. And I then, don't care what anybody says. Ewoks were fine. I, I love I love the Ewoks. <laughs> I love Return of the Jedi. <laughs> and Simon Kinberg, who uh, is kind of in and out of the X-Men franchise, uh, who wrote X-Men Last Stand. So there's that. And Dark Phoenix. So he did Phoenix Saga twice. Poorly. Um, Yo, yeah. Another conversation another day. <laughs> God, yeah. Let's don't... get in a fight about X-Men now. Yeah. Uh, the idea is to make Star Wars an annual event. So you would go like a saga film, standalone, saga, standalone. And it would just sit there and just be every year. Um, and with the standalone films being of smaller budgets. Uh, so, you know, how smaller that uh, Rogue One looks. Right. <laughs> Kasdan's film would eventually be Solo, uh, which he wrote with his son, Jonathan. Um, but that is another episode for another time, a totally different shit show. So I, don't even comment on it, YouTube. Don't even talk yeah. about it. <laughs> Watchers. We don't. I on, I forgot that movie existed until the second you just said that. And I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's why there's no more standalone films. Um, so then Kinberg's was the Boba Fett movie that Josh Trank was going to make. And Josh Trank, again, another episode for another time, Fantastic uh, Four. Fan-four-stick. Fan-four-stick. Uh, that was its own, again, shit show. You can't wait. Um, I don't have anything for Close Collection for that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's not until May of 2014 that Noel's untitled film would be announced with Gareth Edwards signed on to direct one week after his Godzilla film opened. That's the one with Brian Cranston um, Aaron very shortly. Taylor Johnson. Yeah. Uh, Lucasfilm had only seen his first film, Monsters, from 2010, and were like, yeah, this would be a great guy to direct. So, and then they obviously saw uh, Godzilla in the process. And they interviewed him, obviously, to find out he's a huge Star Wars geek. Ah. Uh, for his 30th birthday, he went to Tunisia to the Skywalker home oh. and, and brought. Blue, blue dye and, and some put milk. in some milk. He just sat in take... the, he just sat in the desert drinking blue milk on his birthday. It's the saddest birthday I've ever heard. Is it though? Just or like, is it just really, really kidding? awesome? Say Clint it's... say Clint doing I that. Mean, he would love that. L- listen, I guess like you do you, Gareth Edwards, and also Clint, but that sounds like no fun. <laughs> That sounds like a great time. I so would the house is still there, yeah. just in the Tunisian desert, just like chilling? Yeah, from what I understand, I don't know, like, if there's someone that's upkeeping. From what I, I know, that it's, like, way in the fuck out there. Yeah. Like, it's pretty hard to get to. Well, um, happy birthday, Gareth. <laughs> Nerd! <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. So, Jenny Ray, you're going to be our... Uh, Gareth Edwards. Uh, he's, he is. He's British, right? Yes, he is okay. British. So you can um, uh, you can do it at that if you want. You're going to be Edwards for the whole time, and then Clint, you're everybody else. All right, cool. So this is um, Gareth Edwards about being pitched to do Rogue One. Honestly, I was hoping that I hated it. I was in the thick of filming Godzilla. I wanted a break, take six months off, and reevaluate my life. I was like, please be rubbish, please hate it. And I got to the end of the paragraphs and was just like, ah, fuck. It was like, checkmate. You've got to do it. I couldn't sit in a cinema and watch somebody else do this. If you believe in the Force, it was like I was destined for this. I love this guy. (laughs) (laughs) If you believe in the Force. uh, If you really like blue milk and you believe in the Force. Listen, the blue milk that you can get at Galaxy's Edge at Disneyland is really good. If you go to Disney World, you can get some alcohol with it. And that is also really good. Get some rum in your Uh, your blue coconut milk. Yeah, it's fucking delicious. I got got a blue Russian. Yeah, Yeah. I got got lit on blue milk. See, he would definitely go maybe, to the desert with blue maybe milk. Maybe that's maybe that's what Gareth Edwards was drinking in the desert. He's just like, I got my little flask of rum and my blue milk. Woo, party in the desert. Was he by himself? I really hope he wasn't. It, it was, no, I mean, he, someone well, took photos. His... There's photos of him. Okay, okay. So someone was taking pictures of him. I mean, he, pro- he probably had a camel. There was probably a camel there. Yeah. You know, he just set the camera so. on the camel and just yeah. did a. <laughs> just making that noise, you know. The set the camera on a timer. Yeah. <laughs> And then um, with this announcement, Gary Whitta, who wrote Book of Eli and After Earth, would be writing the screenplay. But by the beginning of January 2015, he leaves 
uh, Widow leaves. Um, no reason is given, but he says it was like a truly rewarding experience and thinks the film is going to be great. Um, he only w- wrote one draft. And at this point, the public does not know what this film is. They just know that they're making one. Gotcha. Um, and Witta and Edwards assumed Disney wouldn't let them have a dark ending for their characters of this film, these rebel spies getting the uh, Death Star plans. Um, so in their like in their version, most of the team survives with very like really silly stuff. Like one of them, like they're all like in a ship and they're like, oh, no, we're going to be blown away. And then like Cassian throws like a carbon freezing bomb. And then they're like, oh! and then when the ship explodes, they're fine. <laughs> But it's like we're now they're just floating in space for, for the for eternity. All eternity. Yeah. <laughs> Which least, also would but at least you. there'd be hope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interestingly, all of Disney's produced featurettes of the the movie, where they're kind of showing off uh, all their behind the scenes stuff, has Witta as one of their interviews. So he was clearly very still much involved in the process. Mm. So it wasn't like he was just like kicked to the curb. We don't like what you're doing. But in March. Chris White signs on to write, and Chris White has a very fascinating career. He was one of the many writers behind Ants. Mm. <laughs> he directed uh, with his brother American Pie. Yes. Wrote and co uh, wrote and directed with his brother again about a boy. Oh my God! Yeah. Wrote and directed The Golden Compass. Wow, this is a roller coaster. Directed Twilight New Moon. Oh my God, yes. If you, okay, for the all wait, of our wait, listeners. Wait, why did you move your yeah, hand for, lower? <laughs> your hand should have been moved higher. Yeah, for all of our listeners, moon. Ian is showing us by moving his hand up and down, showing levels of, of quality. Of quality of these movies. And he's, he went straight down for Twilight New Moon. But I I take a umbrage no, with that. No, that's the dumb one. Oh, that's that the is... boring one. Oh. That, like nothing happens. Oh, that's the second one? I think so. I don't know. Who gives a shit? Right. <laughs> But, we watched all um, these recently. So then he wrote uh, Cinderella, the one that Kenneth Branagh directed a mm. couple of years ago. And that was the reason why they he was already in with Disney. And that's why uh, they they hired him to do. He was already on the set. And they're like, hey, you, yeah. writer, we need a writer. <laughs> we need a Star Wars Cinderella story. Yeah. <laughs> the script, yeah. it fits you. Uh, he already got a parking spot and a badge. We might as well just hire him to do this other thing. Before it um, turns into a pumpkin. That was that was quite a <laughs> that was quite a roller coaster of a filmography. <laughs> right. Highs, lows, everything in between. I know. If you haven't seen About a Boy, fantastic. Oh movie. my god, one of the best. Um it was White's idea to have all the characters die. Which Disney was hesitant at first, but then realized it would make sense because they wouldn't be in new hope mm-hmm. so they're right. like and then it would also be like well you know people die in war and i remember going into the movie just thinking to myself i hope they all die yeah well <laughs> like, i mean like not like i want them all to die I'm not, like <laughs> but some like, like, evil person but i'm just like they should they should all die it's yes. it's the it makes ma- sense the only thing that makes sense yeah, yeah. it doesn't make sense otherwise and it, it, if you think about it, just like just stepping back from that i just that idea of this huge multi-million dollar budgeted Disney Star Wars film, Mm -hmm. everybody dies in it. Like, it's pretty ballsy to be just like, oh, yeah, all these characters we just met, dead. (laughs) Like, in April, uh, Disney has their Star Wars celebration uh, panel convention where most of this was just to, like, unveil, like, the Force Awakens trailer and, like, get all the hype going for that. And it's here they finally revealed the details about the film, now called Rogue One. And these would be called anthology films. It won't include Jedi, which is a question of, like, how do you describe Star Wars, right? Like, what makes Star Wars Star Wars? What are the ingredients of Star Wars, It's right? in the title. Yeah, yeah. War in the Stars. War in the Stars. <laughs> but, yeah, but, like, you're Up right, Up until though. this point. Historically, mm-hmm. it's been very, like superhero base where there's like yeah. super powered heroes and super powered villains and there's like the fight for the galaxy and it's like the really big and epic and there's like lots of spaceships yeah, yeah. The, the first and thing you think of when you think of star lasers. wars yeah as the first thing you think of when you think of star wars is lightsabers right yeah. exactly and force pushes yeah and force chokes <laughs> well just jedi right yeah 
So, um, stormtrooper chatter. <laughs> trooper, trooper, you. <laughs> oh, that's a, a, a nice, uh, blah, 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 having, having a good Wednesday today. Blah, 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 blah. The new T 15s are in stock. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but so, like, this was like this big gamble of being like, what is Star Wars without all of that, right? Mm -hmm. So, this won't have Jedi. Uh, it's inspired by saving Private Ryan and Black Hawk Down. Edward says their characters won't be black and white, saying it's up to a group of new heroes who don't have magical powers. Exactly what you were just saying. Right. Um, and then this was his uh, comment furthering on that. It's called Star Wars. It's about the fact that God's not coming to save us and we're on our own. It's kind of a bleak way of looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> mm, yeah, but also true. I mean, <laughs> right? Yeah. I, yeah, I agree. Anyway, yeah, I feel like when you're like warping to light speed and shit, you're just like, <laughs> yeah, God doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, <laughs> you can literally see through time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Felicity Jones says that her character Jen Erso is unlike Luke and Ray because she isn't wondering who she is or where she's from or whatever, like lost in the galaxy. Instead, mm -hmm. She says she knows where she came from, and that propels the story and her journey, mm -hmm. which I don't know if this is true, like if that, that lines up. But we're going to get to the, whether or not all the things that happen on this movie, if any of this stuff actually lines up. Uh, D Diego Luna calls Cassian Andor the peacekeeper of the group. Uh, no. <laughs> no, that I just watched it again last night. Yeah. It's not. We watched no, it earlier. No. It feels like maybe they don't have a grasp on their characters or like they think their characters are one thing, but then like that's just not how the movie ended up turning out. The latter. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and Riz Ahmed talks about Bodhi being conflicted throughout. Not true either, no. right? No, he's, no. <laughs> um, so sometime after Whites finishes his rewrites, he leaves and what he calls a murderer's row of screenwriters came through. <laughs> Killers. Just a queue of murderers. Pitchforks and yeah. <laughs> torches. Uh, first was Tony Gilroy from the Bourne series. He wrote uh, the first, the four of them, but he made those with Frank Marshall, who is the husband of Kathleen Kennedy. Oh. And he also did an uncredited rewrite on Godzilla, Gareth Edwards' film. Okay. So it kind of okay. made like a like an easy connection right That's there. That's who you know. Yeah, That's right? who you know. Mm -hmm. uh, then for two weeks, Christopher McQuarrie. Bond? Close. Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible. Oh, yeah, yeah. damn it. Uh, and he just finished Rogue Nation. Oh. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. While filming, uh, and that's when filming started. And then Scott Burns, who does a lot of um, Steven Soderbergh's movies. Uh. And then Michael Arndt, who did, he did the first draft on Force Awakens. The, he made some notes. Um, so, But why did he call that a murderer's rose? Because all those guys would just go in and they'll kill it? They'll <laughs> just, crush it? It was just his version of, I mean, some of those are big people. I mean, Christopher McQuarrie and T Tony Gilroy are really big. Yeah, yeah. So, That's what I'm saying. Like, it was it was like the who's who of, yeah. like, like, screenwriters, like, hot Disney. screenwriters at the time. Did Jack Barth have a chance at it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Barth! <laughs> Like you're too get, old, Get Barth. in there, Barth. <laughs> Give it a shot. Barth watch. Um, so filming begins in August of 2015. Now I'm going to quote this uh, thing from my video. It just kind of sums this up really well. If Rogue One is known for anything, it's all the removed bits and pieces from the trailers, which unwittingly highlighted the behind-the-scenes turmoil. To be fair, the film represented was the film we got but the overabundance of promotional material contained a fair amount of footage and dialogue that was missing from the final cut. On your own from the age of 15, reckless, aggressive, and undisciplined. This is a rebellion, isn't it? I rebel. The captain says you are a friend. I will not kill you. Thanks. That we are dealing with here is immeasurable. What will you do when they catch you? What will you do if they break you? The 
if you continue to fight. What will you become? I mean, hmm. I have to say that that there's a lot of stuff in there that makes it seem like a cooler movie. <laughs> you know what I mean? So where this all comes from is uh, Edwards um, wanted the cast and crew to feel like they were an independent movie. Like okay. that it was just being, we were just doing this small little budget thing and we're just going to, we're going to feel like our old uh, filmmaker selves or school. Uh, film school. Film, we're, film just, school. we're just like a bunch of film school buddies yeah, making exactly. a movie. Like, I mean, Don't that's worry a, about it. It's just Star Wars. We're making a Star Wars fan film. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's, that's a really good sentiment, it. but you can't escape that shadow. The beast. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Jenny Ray, this is what he, why he talks, uh, what he means by this. Okay. Put an oi in there while you're <laughs> at it. Oi. I spent 10 or 15 years doing visual effects, and if I learned anything from that time, it's that you do the best work when you let things go wrong and embrace the happy accidents. Then suddenly it feels fresh and you're somewhere new. So, I have no idea, by the way, if this is how he sounds. I'm doing like the most posh Mary Poppins <laughs> accent. Right. Probably not what he sounds like at all. <laughs> I mean, arguably, Dick Van Dyke has the best yeah, British right. accent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, all British people yeah. agree. <laughs> all British people sound exactly like how I just did that line. So, <laughs> um, And then here is Forrest Whitaker. Gareth creates a very positive, open environment. I know it's very shut down in respects to the story, but actually that line in the trailer, what will you become, that's an improv line. Gareth was very into pushing and trying to find where the character should go and explore while he was doing it. So it was really an enjoyable experience. I really like Gareth a lot. <laughs> I just like that little bit there at the end. He really let like us him. do whatever the fuck we wanted. <laughs> Therefore, he's mm -hmm. great. <laughs> yeah. So the cast, the cast were encouraged to improv and just like fill their characters and just fill their space, right? Mm -hmm. And Alan Tudyk was the the most to do so. Oh, for sure. Of like, and you can kind of pretty much tell from the movie. Yeah. As as I said, as we were watching it, Alan Tudyk, the best part of every movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Hands he my, down. He was my favorite part of uh, Moana. He's the best part of every movie. Yeah, yeah, exactly. chicken. Um, in this vein, at the end of some days, uh, not every day, because that would be insane, but uh, Edwards would shoot what he called Indie Hour, where they would film random imagery just for the fun of it. Okay. So that is that is independent film yeah, right there. Yeah. Oh my god. And some like bean counter account was like just sweating bullets like this is such a waste of money. <laughs> that's exactly that's exactly yeah. that's exactly right. Oh, uh, that's like a fucking studio exec's worst goddamn nightmare. Uh this what are is they doing down there? This is Edward's Having explaining fun? it. Studio executives are the empire, basically. Um it was just a way for the crew of understanding for now. We're just going to do loads of random shit. Shite. <laughs> Shit I don't know That's It good. was just a way for the crew of understanding for now We're just going to do loads of random shit Don't try to ask, we can't explain It would just be things I thought were a beautiful moment Or this is a great idea And a lot of the stuff in the trailer ended up through that process So It started with Felicity Jones walking to the next setup of filming Like she was just going just, just to their next little bit and when the lights turned on on that tunnel, when it goes doo -doo 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 -doo, like upwards and and she turned around at that moment and he was like, oh, that was cool. Like and so he wanted to wanted to film it. And he was like, guys, just promise this will only take like 10 seconds. And he was like, <laughs> then that turned into a half hour with like 17 takes. Uh -huh. And that that shot is in the original teaser trailer. <laughs> That's like me and my friends as kids, like just like. Just dicking around with the with the home camcorder. Exactly. Like making, your yeah. Your film school like mm -hmm. kind of mentality of like this is awesome. Yeah. I definitely love the spirit of it. Like anyone who's who can take the hell that it is to make a movie and just be like, let's just have fun, guys. Yeah. Because right? it's so fucking stressful, and there's so much that can go wrong, and there's so much money on the line. So like the fact that he was just like, you know what, let's just let go of all that and just have fun for an hour. But again, I'm telling you that like so many people were getting so sweaty <laughs> yeah, for at the sure. amount of money that was being spent. Okay. So it's just going to get a lot more complicated now. <laughs> so this is uh, Ben Mendelsohn, Clint, mm -hmm. um, talking about how what, – what Forrest Whitaker was talking about, how like they would just um, – were allowed to move around in their space. But it goes way deeper than that. 
We did have multiple, multiple ways of going at any given scenario. We had multiple readings of it. So should they ever decide to, there would be a wealth of ways of approaching these different things. And I know from having seen sort of the crucial kind of these scenes throughout it, I know there's vastly different readings of at least four of those scenes. So perfect example is what those in the trailers versus uh, the movie, where in the trailer you see Krennic, uh, Ben Mendelsohn's character, his demeanor towards Vader. He seems very like arrogant. Aggressive. Aggressive, yeah. You know, the power we are dealing with, right? And and he seems like un frightened to be standing in front of Vader right, 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 right. versus the movie he is like cowering in front of him yeah. I have I have a question about director Krennic okay okay <laughs> what was his role and rank like he's the he's director Krennic <laughs> he's director of Death Star operations is he like the project manager of the Death Star yeah, yeah you could say that yeah director of Death, Death Star construction operations <laughs> okay limited <laughs> LLC. <laughs> LLC. Because <laughs> it's, I mean, because Tarkin like takes over, right? And he's like, I'll be taking over the station, Krennic, Krennic. Yeah. yeah. Right? And, yeah, now that it's built, Tarkin's like, this, uh, this is mine, is mine now. now. This is mine. Boo, 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 boo. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So he's the, he's the project manager hired. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's why if I think any it, of that makes any sense. That's why. I, yeah. That's why I think it seemed like uh, who would want Krennic. that job? <laughs> Anybody in the empire who you would want fascist. that? Well, he was like, but like I think he was using it to try to like climb yeah. the ladder. But don't then, choke on your aspirations. Um, uh, your, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's Vader working on his Type Five for the yeah, comedy yeah. loft. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But then, but then that's also why he had kind of a chip on his shoulder where he's like, Mer, that's my Death Star. I built it and yeah. I want to go to You're standing on my it. achievement. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's why he was getting so like all grumpy about it with yeah. Tarkin. Mm -hmm. So again, going back to the like, he would play scenes in different ways. Mm. Like, this is Empires of the Deep all over again. <laughs> Yeah, that, but, the, the king who's like they're like they're, uh, yeah, like he's just like you have to play it differently. Like play more but, Shakespeare, play posh. But, but how do you cut you're, that together? You're starting to yeah, you're starting to see it right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. So and this also might explain why like Jin is in in those trailers is very like let's get this over with, right? Yeah. Like, I think she literally says that like and like she knows what's about to happen versus she in the movie she's like what is this. Yeah. Like she's confused. Yeah. So um, that might explain that. Well, but... the, the trailers also make it seem like she was like more of a badass because she's in prison in the movie, but it doesn't ever explain why. Yeah. And it's just like, oh, look at like, here's your, we're going to read out your rap sheet because you're such like a hard ass. And she's just like, yeah. And it <laughs> seems like they like specifically like recruited her to be part of the rebellion. Yeah. When, when in the movie, they're like, no, we just need you to get to Sagarera because yeah. your dad. Because yeah. your dad. <laughs> exactly. So, and and we'll, yeah, we're going to go into all of this. So, uh, Mendelssohn also says there are alternate, you could make alternate cuts of the film where there would be 20 to 30 scenes would be enormously different. Interesting. Wow. Which is kind of like, how do you cut that together? Okay. <clears throat> so. I, yeah. I, <laughs> you don't is the answer. So. Ray's triggered again. Um, <sighs> <laughs> Filming ends in February of 2016. Get your inhaler. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so a rough cut is put together and uh, Edwards or Disney, not sure who, didn't feel like it was coming together as well as they hoped. This is Edwards talking about the editing process. I really fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn. Um, now I see where I've gone wrong. Uh, normally, when you put a film together, it goes together like A, B, C, D, E, and you move on. Whereas we had so many permutations, so many different ways it could be constructed, it took longer in the edit to find the exact version. Well, that happens when you have characters changing their... Changing their minds, <laughs> changing their characterization, yeah. changing their motivations, <laughs> yeah. changing their, like, the way that they relate interpersonally to other characters. Yeah. You can't you, improv you, your plot. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. You can't, you can't have Krennic one hand being like, let me talk to the emperor, to being like, it's, it's, yeah. it's good, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you like me? <laughs> yeah, I mean, at that point, you're basically making a fucking documentary. Yeah, and that's what he was talking about. He's like, it was uh, it was editing like a a documentary, and it's like, yeah, yep, 
but that's not how movies work. Right. <laughs> like, you need to have consistent characters throughout or it becomes say, nonsense. Yeah, even d- a documentary has consistent characters because they're real people. And yeah. so they are who they are. But but you can m- move a documentary into any other – you can put whatever v- dialogue into whatever scene. Can you imagine just watching shit where it's just like – where dialogue just does not make sense to what is happening. Like you can't just reconstruct it. You can't go A E C F. It doesn't work that way. Hey, I got yeah. Pulp Fiction. Who cares? But sources say at the time that the movie is very much uh, a war film, but perhaps it needed to be lightened up a bit. Seeing the final film, I don't think there's a lot of levity in it, which is kind of interesting. Um, Edwards kind of alludes to L.A. Times that the movie could be could have been sold as is, but he and his team felt like they could improve it. And Disney gave them their full blessing to change whatever was needed. Mm. Like they were like, let's make this standalone film work. Right. Right. So Kennedy shows this to, again, the closest person already to it. Tony Gilroy asking, why isn't it? Why isn't it working? And he kind of sees it and he's just like that you're you're playing with too many things uh, and the film is about sacrifice and that should be like the core of it. So his suggestions were so crucial. They asked him to write all the new scenes, all this these changes and to be Edward's second unit director on the reshoots. Oh, wow. So. In June of 2016, they start the five weeks of reshoots, which is a lot. Mm. <laughs> um, and rumors start that nearly 40% of the film is being reshot. And according to reporters, sources uh, say it's simple character stuff, like uh, it's just a lot of talking in cockpits. This is total <laughs> bullshit. Ah, uh, the old <laughs> this talking, and, talking and cocking. <laughs> the old cock and talk. The old cock talk. <laughs> yeah, we got we to gotta shoot some cock and talks. <laughs> Later today. Can you cock and talk with me? Yeah, hey, let's go. Uh, let's go do a little cock and talk. A little cock and talk. Uh, I've seen that movie. That's what I'm gonna start calling like one on ones at work until I get fired. Cocked. Let's, uh, let's go a little cock talk. Is any time as a man? Par- pardon. That's funny. Now, now Ian and I know each other's bosses, so that'd be really funny if we started to call us. Hey, hey, oh. boss, we're gonna do a cock and talk. I mean, if yeah. you explain. Well, talk. I was having a cock talk with, with, uh, with, with Elliot. Yeah. I mean, but if you explained the beginnings of Elliot would be into it, he'd be like, oh, of course, of course, of course. But Elliot would be like this. Mm. <laughs> um, OK, so in 2016, they start these um, reshoots. And is some of these some these same sources say if it was actually 40 percent, the studio would have delayed it. Uh-huh. Um of course not. Big studio films never do this. Never would just make a release date and then change it. You know. Yeah, they never um, do that. <laughs> and not and let the film go out terrible. Um, but per Edwards, one third of the film needed work. But I don't know what he means as if that was how much was reshot. So without a doubt, Tony Gilroy is the driving force behind the reshoots mm-hmm. and is supervising the final edit with his brother, John Gilroy. Now, Edwards might have like a back seat, but he's still very much involved. It, it's not like uh, invasions where he, the director's out mm-hmm. and a new person. They lock in. the editing bay. Yeah, like hey, the, guys, those kinds. Yeah, yeah. Guys, like, can I come in? Yeah, mo- mo- a lot of the times that we've talked about that, right? I did Godzilla. Um, <laughs> yeah. Get a, get a um, get Edward somewhere that blue milk and lock the door to the editing bay. <laughs> <laughs> to the moon. <laughs> um, Mendelssohn alludes to the to his reshot scenes were focusing on one of his renderings. Like, oh, of course. Where they were like, okay, now that, like, we're going to pick that direction for your character. Exactly. And now we have to go reshoot all the other scenes that were all inconsistent because you shot them all like, crazy. Like, in <laughs> crazy people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, it's just, it's crazy that it got to this point. Yeah. It's like, like your character. So, to what your point that you were saying earlier, like, you can improv like lines and like, especially with comedy, right? Yeah. But you shouldn't be improving. Your character. characters, yeah. character motivation, character dynamics, yeah. like like big core things to yeah. the movie. Yeah, exactly. that's that's themes, stuff that... <laughs> tone, <laughs> plot. You know, 
those things. Uh, anything, anything that's in an Academy Award category <laughs> yes. should be nailed down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. Um, whether Edwards felt railroaded, and, um, or was playing ball, or appreciated the help, he's been very vocal about being collaborative through this process. Um, here he, he is talking about reshoots in general, I guess. You can have a dictatorship creatively where you say, we're going to do this, this, and this, and I'm not going to listen to anyone, and I've pre-decided it in my head. I think that kind of filmmaking is like the Empire, and this other kind of filmmaking is more like the Rebellion. I feel like I'm more of a rebel than those other guys, so I prefer to be in that camp. As he slips his blue milk. Yeah. <laughs> hey guys, let's do a different version of that scene. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Could you imagine uh, uh, craft services like has blue milk on the menu? <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is for um, Gareth. So was, was I mean, writer. he said like d- directing can be a dictatorship, where it's like we're going to do this and this and this, but also like there's a way you can do it where it's also not like anarchy because I would also say that the rebellions like pretty fucking organized. Yeah. That's like one of the, that's kind of one of the themes of this movie, right? Like she says to Cassian where he's like, I was just following orders and she's like, Oh, well if you were just following orders without thinking them through, then you're no better than the empire. Right. Yeah. So it's like, they still have like structure and discipline and orders and stuff or else it wouldn't fucking work. Yeah. All Edwards cares about is that if this film lasts decades to come. So whatever that took to happen, whatever that takes to whatever he needs to do to his film, he would do it. He wants it to he wants uh, it to to stand the test of time. Like, yeah, exactly. He is, he's like, like, I don't yeah, I'll do whatever it takes to make it work. Yeah. So All he's right, always pretty. been very like yeah, let's make this better. Like, who who, who do we need to bring in? Yeah. He seems like an easygoing guy without a big Absolutely. ego. Absolutely. So that's cool. Yes. Because it's, there's exactly. not very many people like that in Hollywood. Well, exactly. I want to be his friend. I want him to take me to Tunisia. <laughs> yeah. You guys are going to go drink so much blue milk in yeah. the desert. It's going to be fucking awesome. Two I bet men, I two bet men found dead in the desert <laughs> yeah. from dehydration. Yeah. <laughs> we'll look just like Uncle Aunt, Aunt Beru and Uncle Loam yeah. outside of the homestead. <laughs> you guys accidentally let yourself on fire somehow. <laughs> Frozen in carbonite. How did that even happen? Yeah. Or bleached bones. <laughs> um, whatever, whatever happened with these reshoots, visual effect shots went from 600 shots to 1,700. Wow. <laughs> so. Well, they had to green screen all those cock talks. <laughs> There's a lot of green screen action. Well, it's funny that you say that. They used unfootage of the rebel pilots in A New Hope. Uh-huh. To put them in the battle over Scarif. Yeah. So you see yeah, like gold cool. leader and red leader and stuff like. But that was an idea from the beginning, because uh, he because yeah. he saw the the footage was in the vault and then he was like, oh, let's take a look at it. And so he used uh, alternate takes and stuff like that. Right. Right. But what else outside of that? I have no idea. Yeah. In the first two trailers, you don't see any of the battle uh, above Scarif. In the mm. space, so maybe it was that. Mm. I'm not sure. And that's that's like a lot. Of, that was a lot of hefty effects work. Like the right. entire like last third of that movie is so com- yeah. like yeah. complex. Exactly. So how much work did Gilroy do on the film? Well, it was enough to earn him five million dollars for his work. Mm. Um, he then he does this interview like a, a year or two later, and he kind of starts bragging about. Uh, on this podcast about how he came in after the first cut, after they first edited it, and when he came on after it, he was like, I got a screenplay credit that was easily won in arbitration. Mm. So, meaning his work was significant enough to warrant a writing credit Mm. um, with uh, Chris White's, um, and he fought to get that credit. Yeah, you have to prove that in front of the Writers Guild. And that so you've if he done said significant it was, enough of right. stuff. Yeah. So if he said it was easily won, then yeah, that means he did a pretty fucking big chunk of work because I don't the Writers Guild does not willy nilly just give credit to people. Exactly. Yeah. So um he says his superpower is that he says, I don't like Star It isn't that I don't like Star Wars, it's that I've never been interested in Star Wars ever. So I had no reverence for it whatsoever. So this was Gilroy. This is Tony Gilroy. Mm. And he says that the filmmakers before him were in such terrible, terrible trouble that all you could do was improve their position, Mm. which (laughs) like, was it really that bad? 
Um, That's some yeah. big cock talk. Yeah. yeah right? Swinging around there. Like, <laughs> hey, that was the podcast he was on. <laughs> <laughs> cock talk with Tony Gilroy. <laughs> Uh, he says there were no assholes in the process. Oh, good. And he had a wonderful time doing it. Interestingly enough, he never mentions Edwards, never mentions Gareth Edwards, and Gareth Edwards has never mentioned Tony Gilroy, <laughs> which I find <laughs> kind of interesting. Mm. Um, then mm. w- during that same podcast, he's asked if he would make a Star Wars film. He says, nah, I don't like it. I, I don't blame him. Like, there's just like we were talking. Teach their own, right? Yeah well, yeah. well, we were talking earlier about how divisive and toxic the fandom can be. There's a lot yeah. of baggage that comes along with signing on to do a star a, a star war. No shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of these one of these interviews um was uh Chris Miller um from Lord and Miller from Lord and Miller interviewing Gareth Edwards about Rogue One because mm. he was in the middle of doing solo and and again we'll go to that another time but he, Gareth Edwards he's like I don't know how you guys are doing it like I'm dealing with a whole bunch of new characters and you're you're dealing with a beloved character like Han Solo. Like, I don't even know how you mm-hmm. can even yeah. jump into that sphere. Yeah. But like to that point, that's why it makes sense for somebody like Tony Gilroy to come in and just be like, I don't care about Star Wars. I'm just trying to make a good movie. Exactly. About a rebellion. Yeah. And like, I understand that story and like all of the rest of the Star Wars-ness of it is just like ancillary to yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's just yeah. icing on the cake, whatever. So when the trailer company was given the film's footage, all the films, all the footage, they found all of that indie hour stuff. That and, looked like super awesome and trailer worthy. Yeah. And yeah. they were like, let's put those into the trailer. So that is that explains some of the stuff on there. So uh, Gareth Edwards confirmed only two of them. One is Jin turning around in the hallway as the lights come on. Yeah. And then when Ben Middleton Krennic is kind of like standing alone in the. Yeah. The, standing with like the. Yeah. yeah. In the. In. Um, that control room or whatever. Yeah. Of the Death Star. So those are the only two he says were that. But. Like, some of them are so, like, well-composed that you're kind of like, maybe that was it? Like, maybe Krennic when he's walking through the, the water. The water. That's and a it's cool all, the, all the dead soldiers around there. That's a fucking maybe. cool shot, too. I don't know. Um, yeah, but he he never goes on the beach at Scarif. So, like, that shot doesn't. Yeah. But, well, okay, we'll, we'll get to the differences. So, they also, the trailer company also came up with the idea of Jin walking towards the TIE fighter. Ah. Uh, so, like... That's just a shot of her walking <laughs> to to realign the the satellite dish, but they're like, let's put a tie fighter in front of her, and they're like, because it symbolizes the David versus Goliath of this whole story. But it was, it was like it's such a like, yeah. this seems like a really big moment to not have it a tr- in yeah. the movie, right? Well, yeah, and, and you the can't whole story just be putting it's... tie fighters in shots where they don't exist in the movie. <laughs> These coked out trailer bros need to calm <laughs> need to calm the fuck down. <laughs> you know what'd be cool. You know what'd be <laughs> it's like my dude. Tone it down a bit. Uh, I just got this done. Listen to an episode of Cock Talk. <laughs> Coked I mean, out bro, trailer bro, bros. Bro, That's bro, awesome. Bro, tie fighter in the background yeah. while she's walking. Boom. Oh, you fucking just blew my mind, oh my man. God, dude. Let's go to lunch. Yeah. It's 9 a.m. I don't give a shit. Let's do coke. <laughs> Let's go to lunch. <laughs> oh. It's just. Where was the adults uh, during this whole process? <laughs> like, no, 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 Edwards, you can't just have him suddenly become a coward. Yeah. Like, also, you... if you give a trailer editor just a folder of cool ass footage <laughs> that's called like Indie Hour, they're gonna be like, oh, <laughs> like what? Wouldn't that be awesome? I don't if... even give a shit if that's in the movie. It's cool. <laughs> Can yep. you imagine seeing a movie like? I mean, this is the closest I think there is, but like just an entire trailer's worth. Of footage that is not in the movie, because because like I, I like, like I said earlier, is like to be fair, like all of that other stuff that we that was cut, it's still the same movie. Like we still got all the same stuff yeah. with with all these rebels trying to find Sagarera and they're the Death Star plans, and then they go to a, a, a tropical planet. Yeah. Well, there's to, this to... interesting beauty to it all because they take this they take this one small line from an opening crawl of the first movie. Mm-hmm. Let's make a whole movie around it. And what we see in the trailer is that. Yeah. And what we see in the final film is that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. such a beautiful, just kind of like real poignant idea of like, let's just take this 
simple opening crawl and then make a movie from it. I mean, that. they didn't have to do a whole bunch of indie hour to go, oh, maybe that's the movie we should make. That is true. That is true. <laughs> Spent all their time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to, to be real, though, like it, it does start to get into the territory of false advertising a little bit where yeah. it's like. Yeah. Where was Ana de Armas? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to sue so, some motherfuckers. So and, and I and I do I do I do think we should do an episode about like misleading trailers. Yeah. And oh, I don't yeah. I don't I don't think because in like in my video, I do point out like how um, Sweeney Todd in the trailer for Sweeney Todd, you don't see any singing. Mm. And that, that's a whole fucking musical. Right. Yeah. Or um, <laughs> in in Drive. <laughs> With Ryan Gosling, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's 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 supposed to look like a Fast and the Furious movie. Right. Yeah. That is not a Fast and the oh, Furious no, movie. No, 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 <laughs> no, it's just it's just furious. There's very little driving. To <laughs> yeah, be had very. In that movie. But I don't think Rogue One's is false advertising because it is kind of we all got the, all the stuff that we saw. Yeah, that's just for, a different version just, of just, it. Just a slightly me, different version. I, but I will say though that like to me the trailer makes the movie look cooler because especially the version where they're like we have a mission for you and Jin's kind of like a little more like badass and like yeah. she's coming across as a like th- the, yeah, more the, of a like hardened criminal the like the trailer makes it seem like she's uh like she's just like she's already part of the rebellion yeah, but she's yeah, like yeah, yeah. more of like a saw Gerrera type where they just can't pin her down yeah you know? yeah. yeah you can't, like, can't tell me what to do yeah it's like yeah because yeah. <laughs> yeah. she's like I rebel. Like, she's, like, rebelling against the rebellion, but she's part of the rebellion. Like, so that <laughs> yeah, was a little yeah, bit misleading, yeah. yeah. I, I do remember, though, coming, coming out of that movie, and the first thing I thought was, like, what the fuck was that TIE fighter sh- <laughs> shot? <laughs> That's, like, the first thing I thought when it came out of that movie, but I was still really satisfied with it. <laughs> yeah, I just, I mean, it's, you're, you're right that fundamentally we got what was, the movie we saw was what was in the trailer, but it was also, like, to me, it was a different enough presentation okay. of it that it's like it feels like it's not the same movie. Okay, all the way. So we'll we'll go into all those differences. Um, four months from release, editor Jabez Olson. There were three editors on the film, um, and Jabez Olson what suggests that they needed one more Vader scene to line up with A New Hope, and so they're like him and Edwards like, oh yeah, that is a pretty good idea. So they pitch it to Kennedy, who thought it was a great idea, mm-hmm. and they filmed. That hallway, hallway fight mm-hmm. in three days. Ah, oh, the best. The Which best is part of that movie. Best part of that movie. God, almost, editors right? are so smart. <laughs> editors are so smart. I read. I read a comment. One of the comments in the YouTube one, and someone said that like they didn't like that scene. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> the fuck is wrong it, with you? I mean, or no, no. They they said like, oh, Vader was was not as cool in that as he's been in, like in like in a New Hope. It's like, bro. <laughs> Listen, like Vader was fucking rad in that. Like the Vader we've all been fucking waiting for. Yeah, I know that was the Ray Vader we all wanted to see in the prequels. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, for yeah, sure. That's cool. So, and then also Alexander Desplat was um, originally the composer, but because of the reshoots, he had to back out, and Michael Giacchino um, came in, who I absolutely love. Lost. Yeah, I love stuff. Michael love. Giacchino. Um, I saw the oh, Batman. Oh. All the. The Planet of the Apes movies that I, I kind of talk about from time to time. This um, is no offense to Alexander Desplat because he's a very good composer. But like immediately when you said he was going to do the music, I was like imagining the f- score to like the Grand Budapest Hotel. <laughs> I was just it's like, Wes Anderson. That doesn't, <laughs> nope, that doesn't jive. Think that makes about, no sense. Well, just think about everything that you've heard in film in the last <laughs> decade. Chances are it's going to be it's going to be a Giacchino. Yeah, I know. And like and some of the best. Absolutely yeah. best. Um, and he came in and he did the score in four and a half weeks. Damn. Which is really good and it has that very like perfect like uh John Williams like tone to tone it. to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um okay. Let's finally get to this. What changed? From the trailers and a few interviews, we know some of this. Darth Vader is no longer on the Death Star. There's a couple of shots where he's clearly on the Death Star with all the 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 red glow and stuff like yeah. that. And that's clearly not where he is at all in the movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So so that means him and Krennic's scene was completely reshot, which explains why he was so like aggressive to Vader. The power. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Versus him kind of cowering in front of him. Mm-hmm. I deserve an audience. <laughs> <laughs> um this is Riz Ahmed about his character. My character started off as this total other dude. And by the end of the movie, from a combination of what I was doing and what they felt the story needed, he was just a totally different character with a different name, a different job, a different everything, and much more part of the ensemble. Hmm. So, does that mean all of his scenes were reshot? Because he's the 
he's like the crux of it all. Like well, a it, little bit. That, yeah. 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 So if all Bodie scenes are new, okay, right. they we do know that Bodie's first scene when he's walking, going, are you saw Guerrero? Right. Yeah, talking to two tubes. Yeah. Like um, <laughs> mm-hmm. him. I know his name. That's, and Cassian's introduction when he finds that other guy and kills him cold blood. Oh my god! Right? Ruthless. Um, those were done in the reshoots. Okay. Those okay. are new introductions, as are Jin being in prison, and being rescued. Also, one of the behind the scenes videos has a very quick shot of Jin, adult Jin, Felicity Jones standing next to a shaved head Saw Gerrera. So. Hmm. Considering all of that, the trailers go back and forth on what the rebels know about the Death Star. It kind of sounds like they know what it is, and then sometimes it sounds like they do know what it is, and it's like there's a test imminent, and we need to know how to stop it, right? And it's it's kind of vague, and it kind of seems to change. So that and what they're asking of Jin, what they need her to do for the mission, right? So if Bodhi was reimagined entirely... It changes Cassian's mission mm-hmm. because in the movie, the final movie, he needs to find Bodhi. They're looking for the pilot, right? Right. And which made Saw more of a plot device. Mm. So all of that footage of shaved head uh, Saw Gerrera was all gone. Other than that one part where he opens up the the hidden the hatch, the hatch. Oh, yeah, yeah, when he gets started outside of that, he's he has a full head of hair. Hmm. Yeah. Everybody got that? <laughs> so be good, for goodness sake. <laughs> so, like, something completely fundamental changed, yeah. right, within that whole thing. And, like, like, it makes more sense with what they were saying in the trailers. Yeah. If, like, Jin like, was... Because whole... a shaved head Saw Gerrera is more of a B- 5 BBY Saw Gerrera <laughs> as opposed to just right up before A New Hope Saw Gerrera. <laughs> Nerd! Um, yeah, yeah, be, yeah. Because and to be honest, like the way that it is in the final movie is actually very convoluted. Where it's just like, oh, like this pilot like has this important message, and he's like delivering it, and he's delivering it to like Saw, and so we, and so like we have to go get Jin because like we need to get to Saw Gerrera, mm-hmm. and he only will trust her because he knows her, and like he's now this like this paranoid paranoid psycho who doesn't trust anybody, and, and like yeah. that's like very convoluted. In a weird way, and so it, I, like I don't quite understand why that's a change that they would have made, but what, I don't know but how we don't, it was. We don't know what. Yeah, we don't know what it was. Yeah, right? yeah. Right. It so could have been worse. Because it doesn't also make sense why he just suddenly joins the rebellion. Because he's like he was like an imperial pilot, cargo pilot, and he's given this message by Urso, and then suddenly he's just like why? Like why does he deliver it? Like why like does he some, defect? When someone when someone shines a light on something that you thought was to be true, that is just really actually really fucked up because they're building a huge weapon that's going to destroy a world, it probably clicks something in Bodhi's where he's like, yeah, oh, fuck, that's what I'm a part but of. That yeah. wasn't in the movie. Yeah, like and so. What's do you remember when I said? Remember when I said when he was at the celebration? He says his character was conflicted, right? Mm. So oh. like probably his original version was like. Should I go against the empire. my my empire yeah. versus them just streamlining it, saying he's just affecting? He's just doing it. Yeah. But there was like they they threw in like a line that felt like it just a thrown in line to explain his character motivation, where he was like, Urso told me that if I wanted to like be good and make something of my life, I had to like do this or whatever. Oh yeah, with Jin. Yeah. Okay. And it's like okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and like that one sentence that was very like a like throwaway <laughs> line is just like that's my whole character. Well, motivation. I mean, we but, can't all have the ambition of a director Krennic. Yeah. <laughs> we have but, to, you know, we, some of us are just going to be lowly cargo pilots bodies. forever. Sometimes <laughs> some are Bodies, some are Krennics. But but again, it's it goes to this the idea of what was it before, yeah. and was that line you're talking about originally in the movie? Yeah, yeah, or was like it a reshoot? It was a, yeah, it's all these patches. Right. Right? So, biggest change that we know of, in the original film, the Death Star plans were in a separate building than the transmission tower. Oh, so, the Empire hence, just making things more difficult for themselves. <laughs> so, hence all the battle footage of Jin and Cassian on the beaches, oh, which they're they not ha- involved in at all. Yeah, yeah, because they would have had to make it to the other building. Yeah, exactly. So they during just the got edit, cut for time. yeah, during the edit, they found it was dragging out the ending, mm-hmm. um, and so Gilroy combined the buildings 
But in doing so, it changed the fates of all the characters about where people actually die. So in a complete random chance, um, there's this one behind the scenes feature that like ABC News was doing where they're like, let's I explain how motion capture works for the old people, you know? <laughs> and they're showing how K2SO is made, yeah. right? And of all the footage that they show of Alan Tudyk in, uh, in his like motion capture suit, they inadvertently during this special show Alan Tudyk being shot to death on sand and next to what looks like Cassian. I don't know how that footage ended up with ABC News, <laughs> like to show how he dies. Like, yeah, use this right. footage. That seems like a right. big oversight because <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, Disney he, owns ABC. I know. Yeah. Again, he, we're the adults. <laughs> he dies. Yeah, he dies at the console. Yes. Wow. Yeah. So he's in sand, and that's Cassian's outfit. Mm. So it was. Everybody's like, "What the hell?" Yeah, so yeah. did they die as they got to the other side of when they were running from the beaches? And Cassian, that's how Cassian originally, both those characters originally died. Mm. I mean, can we get Diego Luna on the phone? And... <laughs> Diego, Diego, listen, we need to talk to you about this movie. Or, or, or even Alan. I would love to speak to Alan. Um, oh, yeah. Alan, give us a call. <laughs> we'll get. Well, our people will call your people. We'll get it. We'll get it figured out. But yeah, your people is me. And yeah. <laughs> Interesting, right? Very, very, so, like, yeah. how the hell that got out to ABC News is very just so weird. Yeah, but again, they're probably just thinking like, well, it's just a bunch of old people watching this. Like, <laughs> yeah. they're, they're, they're two they don't, they don't know their ass from their elbow when it yeah. comes to Star Wars. They didn't count yeah. on old Ian here <laughs> scraping the internet to find that footage. <laughs> so that is all the changes that we know of. Um, in the end, Chris White says all the credit should go to Gareth Edwards that he was the driving force behind all of this. Uh, he set the mood, the aesthetic, um, the fact like the, the movie is like all handheld versus how beautifully shot all the other Star Wars movies were. Mm -hmm. Like he wanted to look gritty. Yeah. Um, and uh, so Chris White's, and he's talking about this a year afterwards. And he was, and he's like, that movie should go, like the credit should go to Gareth Edwards. Yeah, because it does, it does give us a different view of mm -hmm. the Star Wars universe. Yeah. Yeah. Which I which I which I appreciated because it ends up just giving us uh, more to like build upon and enjoy, and it gives me more options to buy things. <laughs> <laughs> I love me some toys. But got a Bodie action figure. Yeah, but the I don't know. Original if, yeah, Bodie. but I don't know if he's like he's if he's conflicted or. Uh, <laughs> I got an original in the box mint conflicted Bodie action figure. <laughs> Conflicted Bodhi. It's worth like two thousand dollars on eBay. Yeah. <laughs> um. Says so conflicted Bodhi on yeah. the box. So, uh, the speaking of Riz Ahmed, this is Riz Ahmed talking about um, when people kept asking him about reshoots. So yeah, there were reshoots, but if people want to read anything into that, I would encourage them to read into the guts it takes to unpick stitching rather than just try to embroider over it to make it right. I admire Lucasfilm president Kathy and Gareth and the whole team for having, to, for having the guts to go, let's reopen this. Let's do some of this again. I think it's because they really care. And hopefully that's something that shows when people go to see the film. Yeah. And then this is um, Gareth Edwards about the Gareth. end of all of this. There's two quotes here. And I think these are very, <laughs> they kind of sum up our show as well. <laughs> all great films have stories attached to them of how horrific they were to get made. Knowing that going in, you're kind of expecting a bit of a war. You end up feeling like the characters in the film, that we're trying to do this impossible task. Their pretend one is to steal the Death Star plans, but the actual one is to make a great Star Wars film. It would be beautiful if you write a story, you shoot exactly that, and you edit it, and it's a hit. But art, or good art, doesn't work like that. It's a process, and you experiment and react and improve. Yeah? So, yeah. 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 It's a process. <laughs> um... Yeah, you know, this podcast is a process, okay? Art is a process. Very true. <laughs> Whatever, we're all in here doing lines of coke. This is our fourth, this is our fourth reshoot, yeah. <laughs> this is our fourth reshoot of this episode. Killing gun back. I, I, my character was totally different in the beginning. Yeah. I was, con I was conflicted. Clint was very conflicted <laughs> yeah. before. Do I like Star Wars? Do I not? I don't know. I was very arrogant before. That's now true, I'm just you were kind very of... scared of you guys. <laughs> that's, that's true, you were kind of conflicted at the beginning. Yeah, no, I love Star Wars. 
<laughs> um, <laughs> some random stuff. The turbo tank, that prison transport that Jin was in, um, was designed by Joe Johnston. Oh, okay. Peter Cushing's head um, had a his his <laughs> <laughs> was designed Whoops. by <laughs> Peter, Peter, the, Peter Cushing. Peter Cushing's head was on display on set for <laughs> yeah, all of us yeah, to see. Yeah. Jesus Christ! <laughs> Where's the adults? Peter Cushing's uh, digital face. Peter Cushing's had a face mold made of him for Top Secret. Oh, Val excellent. Kilmer, excellent movie. movie. Um, and so, and that was about the same age, and so that's what they used to scan his face. Um, they just oh, they got didn't like go, real lucky. They didn't go like dig up <laughs> his, his, his body. exhum his body and scan his <laughs> face. They were really fucking lucky that Top Secret made that face mold and that someone stuck that in a warehouse somewhere. Right? Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, do we got a Peter Cushing face mold somewhere in the back? Oh, yeah, from Top Secret. I do. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> like Rolodex of like random I've been waiting props. for this for years. Do you want the face mold or his actual get, head? <laughs> get the <laughs> blow dust off of the tomb. <laughs> yeah, let me just look at the files. <laughs> hey, wait, like if, if that shit is just sitting around, that's an 80s movie just like the amount of crap like that whole fucking show that Disney Plus show that was all about oh they're the Disney archives mm. yeah like, well just like not just Disney archives but just everything all this was all the props they've that they've just kept every, yeah that, all the props everybody's kept anytime anywhere <laughs> everywhere it's just insane I would mean, you like to see Mary Poppins bag like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. got all that shit I mean but a, a face like Peter Cushing's face is kind of is like definitely a weird thing to like, hold on keep, to right? yeah right? all yeah. the actors anywhere From of any time especially top secret a movie <laughs> nobody saw I did not know top secret exists. was a movie until maybe like five years ago oh, yeah like I and I, I still haven't seen it but like it came on what? like Correct that mistake. It's almost as good as Airplane. Um, <laughs> Jang Wen, who played Baze, mm -hmm. the big guy with the, the big mm -hmm. gun, uh, he, up into the premiere, he had never seen a Star Wars film. Interesting. <laughs> um, Gareth Edwards cameos in the film as the guy that pulls the release lever on yeah. Leia's ship. Oh. And so he's like, I like to think that it all came up to that point. <laughs> like it all came down to that guy pulling that lever because that's what releases him. And he's like, therefore, I'm also on the ship and I am therefore in a, a new hope. <laughs> oh, he's just like, I am part of Star Wars. Yeah, sly, sly, sly blue milk drinking, drinking motherfucker. <laughs> he's drinking his blue milk somewhere in the galaxy. <laughs> um. So speaking of Leia. Carrie Fisher died two weeks after Rogue One's release. So That's that made – I'm assuming that made it very awkward for people who went to see that movie after that. Mm. That still doesn't really hold up to well. This second – this new watch – this recent watching, I think actually Tarkin looked a lot better than I remember. Oh, that's clinic. that's funny because I thought he looked worse. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I remember, like, I was like, all right, well, look, listen, I can see it's not, it's a digital face, but like, it's okay. And then th this time around, I was like, holy shit, that looks like hot garbage. I do think that was <laughs> smart of them to like, anytime you do see Tarkin, like, he's just like in a dimly lit room. So well, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I mean, but, but they then, still like but, real. I was gonna say, but then <laughs> yeah, there's a. It's like you you gotta use that sparingly. You know yeah. what I mean? Like. It's like when you do like an all digital like monster, not that Peter Cushing's a monster, but like an all digital <laughs> monster in a horror movie. Like you don't want to show that stuff like too much or too up close or too much in the light. Like it's just like, yeah, you know, so I agree with you that like sh having him kind of like dimly lit in the shadows yeah. looked better. But then also his face was always way too lit for the room that he was in. There mm -hmm. was like. Like there was that digital lighting compositing yeah. mismatch that was happening. That was just that was like the thing that stuck out the most. That got to you. Yeah. Rogue One released on December sixteenth, two thousand sixteen, uh, on Rotten Tomatoes, eighty four percent with critics, eighty six percent with audiences. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, box office on a budget of remember these were supposed to be like 60 million dollar <laughs> standalone move films this cost 200 million 
Uh, and it made 533 million domestic, 1 billion worldwide. Nice. So smashing success. Smashing Which is success. why they were like, cool, we'll make Solo. And then they were like, oh. Yeah. And then- <laughs> Just kidding. It's TV shows now. Everything's TV shows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's so true. Well, what a perfect segue. That's why I'm here. And I'm or, big bucks. how did the Disney Plus series come about? Great question. <laughs> so in 2018, Lucasfilm was looking to create a series for their streaming services, and they wanted to explore the origins of Cassie and Andor and K2SO. So originally, they had um, Stephen Schiff was to be the showrunner. He was a writer-producer on The Americans. Ooh, which would have been great show. Yeah, really good one. Man, um, Felicity, about, uh, but very spy spy yeah, yeah, yeah. spy show, but very serious. Um, they even had uh, Diego Luna and Alan Tudyk come on stage for D twenty three in two thousand nineteen to be like hi. Um, but shortly after that, Schiff was out, and who of all people was in? I brought this up when we were watching, and you shushed me because I was like, "Oh, because you're gonna reveal the, the twist of all the people that should not you wouldn't think they who says you would not like to be." Tony. Can I? Can I guess? Is it Gilroy? Yeah. Yes. The one who said he would never do another Star War. Exactly. Because so, I saw his name on all the credits at the end of Andor's, and then I saw his name at the, at the oh, yeah. credits at the end of <laughs> yes. Rogue I've One. I've seen the whole series, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I saw his he name, was, too. Jesus. He was the head writer, showrunner of Andor. Wow. So after Rogue One, which, Kathleen- Which explains a lot ab- about why it's so good, because it's just someone trying to make a good fucking TV show. Yes. Okay. We'll, we'll get, that get is, to that. But... That is interesting. I'm going to hold, I'm going to keep my thoughts to me for okay. a second. So after Rogue One, Kathleen Kennedy asked Gilroy if he wanted to do anything else in the Star, Star Wars universe. And he said, absolutely not. Like he said, I don't, yeah. I don't care. I don't like it. But after Shift uh, wrote his pilot script, which was described as kind of like uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, um, kind of like that. Mm-hmm. Just them going on these little adventures. Uh, she sent that script to Gilroy for his thoughts. And he's sitting there reading it and he's like, it's fine, but it doesn't, it wouldn't hold up for like a long series. Like it, it would just get old too quick mm-hmm. in his mind. Um, you, you know, if it was something like Mandalorian, which is just one offs, well, pretty much throughout, right? Yeah. Right. Um, Saturday morning cartoons. Exactly. Style. So he was like, Okay, if I were to do it, what would I do? So he just sends like this big thing. He's like, you are missing an opportunity to make something truly radical. Hmm. So this is Gilroy talking about what his idea for a Star Wars show would be. I wanted to do it about real people. They've made all this IP about the royal family, in essence. It's been great, but there's a billion, billion, billion other beings in the galaxy. There's plumbers and cosmeticians, journalists. What are their lives like? The revolution is affecting them just as much as anybody else. Why not use the Star Wars canon as a host organism for absolutely realistic, passionate, dramatic storytelling? Yes. I love it. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Also, cosmeticians? What a weird... He's like, uh, plumbers, uh, cosmeticians. Uh, why not be like doctors? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Anyway. Tattooers. Pastry chef. Barista. Blue milk farmers. Farm, yeah. Yeah. Bartenders. Well, I guess there are bartenders in Star Wars. Yeah. So... Uh, I love that thing, though, about the royal family of... Because even Ray turns out to be a Palpatine. Yeah. So yeah, it's like, all, it, it all connected. always yeah. comes back to like, oh, they're all either a Palpatine or a Skywalker. And, they, and it's all focused around yeah. the yeah. people with powers. Yeah. Well, and having having read this and just and heard this, like, that is very apparent in the show, and it works amazingly. Phenomenally. Yeah. yeah. Yes. It's so good. I was thinking about this last night, because you told me, like, watch Andor for... for extra credit right Mm -hmm. and I was thinking about this last night I was like I can't think of any other TV series that I've watched where every episode in a series and like in the first season was like everything was great perfect almost just like so solid I mean don't get me wrong I love I love the Mandalorian and I really enjoyed 
to an extent, the Book of Boba Fett. But there's episodes where I'm like, ah, I can skip that episode. Yeah, you for know? sure. I don't want to skip any of Andor. Yeah, like, and I want to watch it well, all you, over. You kind of can't because it's it's so crucial. Like, yeah, yeah, it's very it's very it's linear. Yeah, you got to see it. Um, so yeah. smart, smart. But uh, I think it was funny. We got a text from a friend who was like, "I did not realize I was going to be watching prestige television," and it's like that's exactly what it is. It's probably one of the best shows this year bar none like it's, very it's, easily it's very very good um yeah, it's, it's good. so okay uh so we'd wrap this up so he was so gilroy was very adamant about that nothing in his show would be fan service if it was in the show it needed a reason which and is so, so smart because there's so many fan like service things that i watch I'm like oh, that's cool because i know that from that yeah, you know, this connection. this random thing, like oh, this person showed up, like in Rogue One. Oh, C three PO has a throwaway line. Yeah, like instead of doing that, it's like no, if it exists, it should work. And it's like the blue milk thing. You see blue milk constantly throughout Andor. Yeah, and it's because that's what people drink. So you would see it. Karn yeah. has it in his yeah. oops all berries. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> his oops, oops all, all berries. berries. <laughs> I did. He was eating that cereal, and I was like. That looks good. <laughs> it does. Really good. I, get, I want some blue milk oops all I, berries. And the oops all berries turned your milk blue. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, preemptive blue. Delicious. But then like you take um like Mon Mothra, like like what a fantastic version of like that character, even in Rogue One, is kind of like, well, it's just kind of tying into the original movies. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, what it what did what how did she get there? Yeah. Like, and it's just so fucking fascinating yeah. yeah her character is great how she's navigating being a senator and being part of the rebellion and she actually has the most to lose and is the most visible yeah and mm -hmm. is the most at risk because she's like a such a public figure right yeah. everyone else can kind of hide in the shadows and she can't hide in the shadows yeah and you feel and like, like real bad for her oh yeah and the dis and like her shitty husband and her kind of shitty kid <laughs> that she's in like yeah. throws under the bus and you're like that's so fucking brutal <laughs> Um, no spoilers. Sorry. Gilroy's goal was also to elevate Star Wars that would appeal to non-fans. Mm -hmm. This is what he says about that. You should be able to watch the show and not give a shit about Star Wars ever or have ever seen any Star Wars. This show should work on its own. The hope, the dream, is that the really hardcore Star Wars community will embrace the show in a new way and they'll, they'll be thrilled to have someone come in and completely uncynically get down molecularly in their world and treat it like a real thing. That's a hard word to say. Molecularly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So so it's it's that thing about how he doesn't he has no reverence for it, right? Right. And so he's like, I'm gonna take this and make it serious, right? Right. So during Chris White's um interview, he was being asked if he would do Star Wars again. And he was like, No, I scratched that itch. He's like, I you know, I had my thing, like I had my reverence for it, and then and then I did it. But it came like, he's like, it kind of came to a realization that Star Wars isn't for me anymore. And that these films are all for kids. And so I don't I don't have that reverence for it anymore. He's like, I still like Star Wars, but like it's it's just not for me. And you take what Tony Gilroy did with Andor and he quite literally elevated it. He changed what Star Wars could be. Yeah. Because it is not fan service, it is not it's not just fun adventures, and you go, Oh, this is what adult Star Wars could be. Exactly. And it's, it's just like, and it just opened a door to be kind of like, that is incredible that it's, finally someone finally did that. It's a really tense, dramatic, political, like thriller. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. That is like, like masquerading as Star Wars. Like if you had no idea what Star Wars is, you would not. I will say though that it still does a pretty good job of, of, of utilizing the world and elements of Star Wars. Like, even, yeah, filling in little holes. Well, yeah, I think that, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That like, just goes like to show the like the costume design, the set design, the you know the the props. It still yeah. feels tonally and visually like a Star Wars movie. Well, I yeah. think that's 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 the juggernaut and the powerhouse that is Disney and yeah. Lucasfilm because they just be like, hey, Gilroy, give us this really cool political thriller. Yeah, and we'll just throw in all the other. Star Warsy details. I'm yeah, like I'm Star sure. Wars yeah, I'm sure he was like. He, I'm sure he writes like you know this happened on. And he's like, insert planet, planet names, names. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And then, like, some nerd goes and fills in that. It <laughs> yeah, because like, like, being the script, and, like, uh, I mean, like, so-and-so looks up at the camera as they're holding, you know, and, like, the camera is a camera from the Death Star. Yeah, like, yeah, like, he doesn't give a shit. He doesn't give a shit what it looks yeah. like. He's like, but I mean, but, he probably does, but, but I mean, yeah. I mean, going back to what you're, like, 
Boba Fett was a terrible show. And Mandalorian, you really kind of like, it makes that m show makes more sense when you think of it as a Saturday morning cartoon. But you watch that and you're like, it's fine. Yeah. And, and you're like, I'm an adult now. And this, this Andor just satisfies that kind of like, oh, this is kind of like what I need. Like, right, yeah, it, that's as, exactly what I was going to say. Within fandom. Yeah, it's, it's, and, that's exactly what I was going to say. It's the Star Wars I didn't know I needed. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right? And I, and after having watched it, I'm like, man, I, I want to I wanna be, I want to I want to see more Cassie and Andor. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Like, so uh, Gilroy has started on production on season two of Andor, Woo. which will be the last season. It's only two seasons. Um, and that season will line up to the beginning of Rogue One. So, was Rogue One worth it before and after Andor? <laughs> um, I mean, I'm going to say it, it's worth it in both ways because as much as we were, you know, sort of talking about the shenanigans that occurred on this and that they didn't, there was a lot of confused direction and confused character motivations and and just weird stuff that happened on Rogue One. I have said before that the last third of Rogue One was my favorite Star Wars movie. Yeah. Like the last third of that movie is so fucking good. Yeah. And that's the part of a movie you want to be good, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like yeah, the first the first half of it is is kind of like a, a bit like all over the map and like there's like l no character development and but but I kind of chalked that up to like well the movie is not it doesn't necessarily have to be about these characters because it's just about the rebellion and the whole point of this is just that like they they don't really matter in the grand scheme because they're just they're like soldiers in this army trying to accomplish this goal of getting the Death Star mm -hmm. you know plans or whatever. But after seeing Andor, I'm just like, oh, no, I did want all of that character development. I did need these people to I did need to care More. about these people. So that I, to me, the week is the weakest part of Rogue One is just the characters and their motivation and relationships, mm -hmm. which Andor just has in spades and fills in all of those gaps. But like that doesn't mean I don't think Rogue One was worth it because I really, really like the last third of that movie. So. Yes, I think it was worth it before Andor, but I especially think it's worth it now just because it's Andor is so 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 good. And that's what I was saying earlier is that simultaneously it was it was it made it better because it filled in a lot of those holes, but then I was also then I'm like, "Oh, well now I'm just really disappointed cuz Rogue One could have been so much better." <laughs> yeah. Right. And it just was like it wasn't. Yeah. I mean, hindsight is always 2020, right? Yeah. I mean, we could talk about anything that we've watched that we've seen other things with, related to it. Like, oh, well, that could have been better because of this. Like, but I mean, if you just take it all as a whole, you yeah. know, uh, yeah. it, it, it does, it does elevate Rogue One, I think. Um, but that's like, I, sometimes I get annoyed that we're, we live in a world now where it's like, you have to watch a TV show in order to watch this movie. Like, <laughs> you know, like did, Multiverse of Madness. It was like, if you haven't seen WandaVision, fuck you, this movie's not going to make any sense. And yeah. then I, and I, I kept telling people that I was like, if you haven't seen WandaVision, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> And they're just like, oh, I gotta like watch a whole TV show, and it's like, yes, this is the world we live in now. And sometimes that annoys me, but then also other times I'm like, but TV shows are such a better vehicle to explore character yeah. and to like give you the time you need to explore character and like and things better. So yeah, yeah. Uh, if you, I mean, look at what I brought. Yeah, it's all worth it. It's, it's, <laughs> I love it all. It's great. <laughs> Clint, Clint take will take all your Star Wars as they are. Uh, well, no, not really. But <laughs> I, I, so, uh, look at him; he's so. I'm conflicted. a cafeteria fan. I kind of pick and choose what I like <laughs> and what I don't like. No, I'm just kidding. I, I I do agree though. Like, but I'm such an optimist when it comes to these kinds of things. Where I'm like, I mean, yeah, Rogue One, you know, had its had its its uh ups and downs, you know, during the production and as a film, as you know, as, as a final product. But I mean, as far as the standalone films go, that, that they have that they attempted, it is the better of the two. <laughs> of the two. <laughs> uh, mm, yes. You know, but with Rogue One, I walked out of it. You know, thinking and after watching it again, after watching Andor, I'm like, okay, there was a few things that were like that were missed in in Rogue One. That like just like Ray was saying, that were picked up in in Andor. Um, but I mean, yeah, I think it was worth it both before and after. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think that all the all that work to kind of make a better movie was worth it. It is definitely. I actually think after watching Andor, it kind of made 
it kind of when you start the when you start Rogue One, it kind of feels like this huge season finale. Yeah, and, and you're kind of like, oh shit! And I think it actually starts really well when you have that in your mind. Yeah. Um, and then it just gets real rocky real quick, um, and it gets real confusing. And then there's that that scene in the, um, in the rain on Urdu or whatever, where Jin's father gets killed, and then she's all pissed that the rebels killed her father. And then the, her very next scene, she's like, for the rebellion, let's all let's all go. And you're like what <laughs> like that makes no sense yeah it's and a it's, complete 180 yeah. based on no nothing and and that, again that could have been something that did with the reshoots but you're right that fucking last third is so tight and so well done mm. and it is what i love about it is it's just those i remember a friend once saying like who gives a shit we know that they're all gonna die and it's like yeah but like what it, what was that sacrifice to get there? And I love that it all came down to each individual character to do one thing. Yeah, and it all came down to Bodhi getting the message up that somebody to to push the switch to someone to open the vault, like what all that, and it just like it gave everybody a purpose. Yeah, for mm -hmm. a one moment, the final sacrifice for the greater good. And holy yeah. shit, yeah, so good that 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 one third. But you're right. It, watching Andor, you're like, this made this movie even better. Right. But it also kind of makes you mad that it it that it existed first. Right. Uh. Well, I think that just about sums it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's never been a truer uh, statement. Yep. Other than Clint is one of the podcasters of all time, of all this is more true. Time. <laughs>